What is going on, everybody? It's Alex coming back at you with another video. And today, Connor Rogers dropped another mock draft. So we are going to be here to review it. If you are new, feel free to like, comment, subscribe. Y'all know how to use YouTube at this point. Blow my face and my board. Below that are all the great ways to get involved with the community, as well as take advantage of our two sponsors, Underdog Fantasy, as well as Olipop. Getting right into this, Connor Rogers going to be coming on the show in the offseason. So super excited for that. That should be coming out within the coming months. So it's going to be great. Maybe we can get our own mock draft with Connor on the show. But of course, you know, Connor is one of the two at um, NFL Stock Exchange that kind of leads the industry. You know, one of the guys who we all kind of look up to. So respect for Connor for continuing to be an absolute beast, being able to give us stock exchange as well as these mock drafts on NBC Sports. Let's get right into this. Of course, that just also means I'm going to be a little bit more of a pain in the ass. It is what it is. Let's start off with the number one overall pick. The Chicago Bears go Caleb Williams. A lot of people are not going to, well, we're divided pretty much in two at this point between going Caleb Williams and essentially not going Caleb Williams. Now, the logic behind Caleb, which I am now in full support of, is you're getting a player with similar strengths, escapability, big play, you know, maybe even a better processor, great mobility, and you're going to be getting him on a rookie contract for essentially five years. And with Justin Fields, he probably has about one more year to truly prove it. We haven't seen Justin truly take that step towards real greatness. Now, yes, Eberflus is not the offensive mind. Luke gets his ass. Like, we get that. There's a lot of excuses for Justin, and Justin's done a fine job. But Caleb Williams is widely regarded as arguably a generational quarterback. I think he is at the bottom of that tier, right above blue chip, and that's worth taking at number one. If Justin really is viewed as a franchise quarterback or a potential franchise quarterback, the Bears will get great draft capital for him. Sam Darnold went for an enormous amount of draft capital compared to what we thought he was worth, and he did not have the momentum that Justin Fields necessarily had. So I do think that it's a smart idea to go after Caleb Williams fiscally, as well as, you know, with Getze being fired. Uh, you can bring in a new offensive mind. I don't know if Cliff will actually demote himself to an OC in the NFL versus an HC, but I do think that it's a possible move. It really is. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, Fluce is going to be back, so the defense is going to be great, but it really is that OC spot where hopefully someone can come in and make the difference because that right now is the biggest gap on the roster. So at pick number two, the commanders go Drake May. So you all already know already, I'm not the biggest guy on Drake May. Now, does that make me correct? No. Could it? Maybe. But Drake May, he has high playmaking ability. He has good escape ability as well. He has a ton of upside. And that is very valuable at a position where, you know, the best of the best quarterbacks are really the ones who are now consistently making the playoffs and making a push. Uh, going after safe doesn't necessarily mean you're getting an actually better pick. You know, maybe it just means the failure is a little bit lower, but the success rate at the end of the day, you're all going for one thing, and that's a Super Bowl run. And, you know, the best of the best usually get that trophy. It's very rare that you're not going to find the more talented quarterback and the more talented team ending up with that trophy. So taking a swing on someone who has that potential makes sense. But for the commanders, you know, I do struggle with it a little bit. That's naturally because Drake May has, uh, you know, to me is just a little bit worse than Jaden Daniels. Has the same escapability. Uh, Jaden Daniels had 17 plus 30 yard plays to Malik Neighbors this year. That guy is going to be running in the four threes, if not four twos. You know, to be able to hit that guy pinpoint accurately down the field, Brian Thomas as well, is very difficult. It requires a lot of skill. And I thought he did it at a little bit more of a consistent rate than Drake um, than Drake May did. So, you know, that's my argument. I do think that it is the right move to go after a quarterback because realistically, with a new regime probably going to be coming in, they're going to want their own quarterback over Sam Howell. Sam Howell's fifth round pick. You know, you don't really put the whole entire team, the whole entire franchise on a fifth round picks back if you don't fully believe in him. And the fact he didn't end off the year really starting consistently is, uh, you know, for me, that's the telltale sign that they're going to be going quarterback. So it makes sense. Quarterback is the right move. But the real question is, which one should they go? At pick number three, the Patriots pass on quarterback to go Marvin Harrison Jr. So this is something I've really wanted to do. And you know what? Next week, in honor of Connor, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have New England pass on a QB. We're going to see what mayhem occurs when we do something like that. 
Uh, you know, Marvin Harrison Jr. is an excellent weapon. The one thing the Patriots have not been able to draft is wide receiver. And, you know, it does kind of make sense to target a receiver that's kind of a no-brainer. And, you know, since it is your respective weakness, of course, Bill's not there. So there's, of course, going to be a little bit more room for improvement in terms of drafting philosophy. But, you know, you can balance out a weakness by getting something that's a lower risk pick. And Marvin Harrison Jr. just does everything really well. Appreciate him for what he does. You know, again, he is my number one player in the class. Absolute beast. It is what it is. At pick number four, the Arizona Cardinals go Joe Alt out of Notre Dame. An intriguing option, of course, with Marvin Harrison Jr. off the board, which again, I appreciate because of the fact that you know, it's kind of a guaranteed at this point that Arizona ends up with him. Uh, you're going to essentially go replace DJ Humphreys with Joe Alt. Joe Alt, widely regarded as best tackle in the class. I'm not there, but again, he's what number nine on my board versus my top tackles at six. You know, it, it really doesn't matter. It's pick your poison. All of them are phenomenal. It just depends on what style of offensive tackle that you're looking for. Uh, for me, I have Talise Fuaga a little bit above him. I do understand him at four doesn't make very much sense but if the draft starts falling i prefer to target a right tackle a little bit later um you know this pick to be fair you know i i I understand it it makes total sense but for me in the draft scenario if you want to go tackle i would trade down you know maybe get yourself a very similar draft compensation to uh what happened last time so that's where my head's at right there Arizona Cardinals can end up getting some good picks, maybe trade back, get to Lee Safewaga, and then kick Paris Johnson back to his native left tackle position. But I would still give this pick an A minus. You know, you do like left tackle is so key, especially when your quarterback is on the smaller side, a little bit more fragile as well. And Kyler Murray, the one thing you don't want is injuries and making sure at least the tackles are solidified is a really, really solid way to at least show your quarterback that you're valuing his uh, valuing his life pretty much there. So it's good to be able to see a little bit of a change up. Joel at four to the Cardinals. At pick number five, the Los Angeles Chargers go Malik Neighbors out of LSU. You know, it's between that and Brock Bowers. For me, I go Brock Bowers solely because I can probably target a wide receiver in round two that, you know, is very similarly talented to Malik Neighbors. Maybe 80% as talented because this is a very good receiver class, even with the Mecca Buka returning and, you know, the plethora of other dudes who are returning. I, Malik Neighbors is a fantastic pick, but it might just be the determining factor where if you're set, if you're dead set on going wide receiver, you very well might end up with an Xavier Leggett in round number two and a Brock Bowers here versus if you really are targeting a tight end, you're going to be lucky if you're targeting Jatavian Sanders, maybe with a trade back in round two. The drop-off there is exponential. The drop-off here, not as much. So if y'all get what I'm putting out there, um, League Neighbors is a great receiver. Would be perfectly fine with it, but when we're playing the long game, I think that there is a potentially better option. At pick six, the Giants go Jaden Daniels. If that is available at pick six, Jaden has to be the selection. You know, there's no receiver that I think should be worth number six overall. Uh, that is still available. And Jaden Daniels offers all the same strengths as Daniel Jones, but just a bit more explosiveness. So that'd be very exciting to see there in NY, or well, I guess it's New Jersey. So NJ, uh, Jaden Daniels would be a massive addition. Because again, Daniel Jones, even with the contract, I mean, you sometimes just have to pull the trigger on somebody who can actually change your franchise. Uh, Jaden Daniels has been pinpoint accurate. And it's really amazing because it's really due to him. He was like t- number one or number two in uncatchable throw rate just a couple of years ago. And to come to this point and be like, okay, well, now he's a top, you know, top six selection guaranteed. That's phenomenal. So props to Jaden Daniels. He's done a great job. At pick seven, the Tennessee Titans go Olu Fashanu. Uh, we all just know it's going to be a left tackle. Which one's there? Select that one. So uh, perfectly fine with that one. Tennessee gets their guy. Of course, they're looking for an offensive minded coach, probably going to be right at the top of the priority list for the offensive coaches, the left tackle at pick number eight, the Atlanta Falcons go Dallas Turner, you know, with one more wide receiver on their roster. That is uh, Drake London after this season. It does seem as if Atlanta might be going after a wide receiver in the top 10 once again. I think Drake London was at pick number eight. 
but edge rusher is also a huge priority. And with the loss of JT Tumalau to going back to Ohio State, as well as a plethora of other players that, you know, just make me want to like rip my hair out. But this is a more and more top heavy position. So it does make sense. Maybe you will get a solid wide receiver, just like I was talking about with the Chargers in round number two, versus if you're really targeting an edge, the class is shrinking exponentially. So big fan of that pick because Dallas Turner really is a phenomenal player. Doesn't get the respect he deserves apart from some of these really, really smart individuals like Connor Rogers. I mean, to be fair, CBS sometimes stumbles upon a someone who appreciates Dallas Turner. But, you know, it is what it is. No shade there. At pick number eight, number nine, Chicago Bears draft Romo Dunze. It seems it's going to be edge, wide receiver, and quarterback. Those are the three positions they'll be looking to go for in a round number one. With Iberflu still being the head coach, I honestly wouldn't be surprised for this to be a defensive-focused pick since the first one was offensive. And again, in a very slim uh, or very top-heavy edge-rushing class, it does feel like that's a way that you can rock. But they don't have a second-round pick. They might feel very uncomfortable with what's going to be available past the second round in the wide receiver room. And they do need to get a big splash player. So very realistic pick. Again, just trying to reason why maybe it might be something else. At pick number 10, the New York Jets go to Lise Fuaga. So my top three tackles are off the board. Uh, you know, if a wide receiver is not available for the New York Jets, I think offensive tackle is the perfect position to go. Even with wide receivers on the board, you know, again, it just really depends on how much you trust the free agency class and the New York Jets front office to go after those free agents. So Talise Fawaga is a great choice. I do think wide receivers from free agency might have a better impact than tackles in free agency. If you do think the talent is there for a day one starter who could be there for 10 years, I would prefer to do that with an injury. Well, not injury prone, but you know, older Aaron Rodgers than to go after some receiving weapons right at this point. So Talise Fawaga, great choice. Probably would be my choice number one. At pick number 11, the Minnesota Vikings go Michael Penix Jr. So I think this is a perfect example. Um, Like Michael Penix is a perfect example of watching people's opinions just fluctuate. They oscillate between Michael Penix is a top 10 player versus Michael Penix shouldn't even be remotely in the first round, shouldn't even be a day two pick. It's quite surprising, but uh, people are very impulsive and you know, that's kind of the fun part of sports is that you get that initial impulse and you really do get to see the human psyche just full display, full display, the animosity of people. It's wonderful, but you know, that's sports for you. It gets you all excited. The adrenaline is where you're, what you're really seeking. And you know, when you get let down, some people like to go a little bit further than what's reasonable. So Michael Penix being a pick number 11 for the Minnesota Vikings. One, I love Michael Penix in purple. Y'all know that. So for me, I like the fit. I have had some issues with Michael in terms of his overall health. It's a little bit older, you know, three season ending injuries. There's definitely some legitimate negatives on Michael Penix. Uh, His footwork, not fully there. But what I saw in that Sugar Bowl game is how much he improved. And he had some good pocket movement. You know, there he was seeming to be injured in that championship game. And that is a little bit worrisome. Like you do have to watch out for a player that has had a big amount of injuries. You do have to worry when he starts holding his diaphragm, like maybe he could have cracked a rib. I don't know. That's obviously speculation. But, you know, with Michael, he performed very valiantly against a very good defense in that Sugar Bowl. I think the momentum is stopped. And maybe he will end up being a late first round pick. For that reason, you know, injuries, lack of momentum, age. Uh, He could end up pulling a Will Levis and slipping a little bit into the second round. But I love the idea of the Minnesota Vikings who have a fully loaded receiving core. You know, you have your top two weapons and then TJ Hawkinson. So, you know, you have all the receiving weapons Michael Penix is used to. And then, you know, from here, you can add in a top tier running back. And, you know, he's going to have a very, very good rookie season and he could get you to the playoffs. So I respect it. I respect it. I don't know if I'm fully there with Michael Penix, but that Sugar Bowl performance really started making me a believer. So those are my two cents on that. Pick number 12, Denver Broncos go Jared Verse. You know, without going after Bo Nix, this is, again, it really depends on your personal opinion of Bo Nix. It does range from he should be a top 10 pick all the way down to being a day two pick. But Jared Verse, I think we're all 
in uh, the same opinion. The common the consensus is that Jared Verse is worth worth a top 15 pick. And Denver Broncos are looking for an edge rusher. I think it makes sense. Don't overthink it. You don't have a second round pick. It's a top heavy edge class. You're looking for an edge rusher. Don't force a quarterback if you don't believe in him. I may believe in Bo Nix, but that doesn't mean that, you know, for example, Connor Rogers, who's making this, would fully believe in him over, you know, getting a player who is the best player available. We'll see what happens, though. At pick 13, the Vegas Raiders go Jerzon Johnny Newton out of Illinois. Uh, fantastic defensive interior. The Raiders have been trying to target defense interior for a very long time. I would personally try to get Justin Fields if you can, if you're Las Vegas, or, you know, wait for round two to see if J.J. McCarthy is there. Now, yeah, for me, I'm a fan of Bo Nix, potentially to the Raiders, but again, it really depends on what you think of Bo Nix. So Vegas Raiders getting a consistent top tier defensive interior, which they have not really had, is not a bad thing. You know, maybe it's not the most exciting thing on planet Earth, but you know it's going to work well. At pick number 14, the New Orleans Saints go Laotu Latu edge out of UCLA. Again, it's another team that might be looking to add in that edge group, but to be fair, looking at the statistics, I think the edge group is a little bit underappreciated. They have them on contract for more than an extra year as well, but it is not the best group on planet Earth. You know, you got Passignon there. Um, you got Granderson, obviously you got Turner in there as well as Cam Jordan. This is going to be a future replacement of Cam Jordan, I assume, and such a phenomenal frame at 265 with long arms, very bendy as well. Hard to find someone who's built like that. Fits the New Orleans Saints MO to a T. I'd prefer Cooper to Gene just because I want him to have a year of training at safety. And there's two excellent leaders in that secondary that are there for one more year that could train him up to be the successor of either Honey Badger or else May. So, you know, again, not a bad pick by any stretch. Top heavy edge class. It fits the New Orleans uh, drafting style. And, you know, again, I just think there might be a better position to go. At pick 15, the Colts then go Brock Bowers. I kind of forgot that Brock was on the board. Always happens. Whenever he slips, um, I do end up forgetting that he is here because you know me. He's going to be gone by pick five or pick six is what it is. But that's because I love Brock Bowers. With Brock Bowers going to the Colts, it's BPA. At this point, you might be looking for a safety as well, maybe another defensive back, maybe a defensive interior. You know, I really love Byron Murphy. That's a sneaky guy for me to be like one of those players that gets picked above where everybody thinks he should be picked. But that dude has some some Jalen Carter to him. That's a big stretch. But, you know, there's even uh, Mason Smith. Some of their moves remind me, since they are so quick, so fluid, and so effective, they remind me of those special clips that Jalen Carter used to have. Now, I don't think it's on the same tier, but, you know, you see the flashes there. If Colts can't pass on Brock Bowers. You can use him in the slot. You can use him on the boundary. He played about half of his reps in the slot in the first place. So, you know, you're going to be getting an asset in the receiving game. You're going to, you can even do some sweeps to him. So it's almost like in the running game, as well as in the blocking game, one of the best blocking, if not the best blocking tight end I have ever seen. And he is relatively lighter, still has some room to add some pounds to his frame. So I think this would be best pick for the Colts because it is the best player available. You know, it's just very hard to find someone like Brock Bowers to ever come out in the draft. Seattle Seahawks then draft Troy Fautanu to be their left guard. Uh, for me, I love Troy Fautanu. He is my number 20, 28 player. I almost did 27, 28 player in the class. And so this is within range for where I think it could be logical. However, there's a lot of really good guards in this class. And it really depends on how desperate the Seahawks kind of are for being able to get an offensive lineman, a left guard. Do you think one's going to be there in the third round? You have both New Orleans and your own third round pick. Of course, we did end up seeing um, these Donovan Jackson left guard out of Ohio State return. That was my dream selection for them in round number two. So even the interior offensive line class is starting to slim out a little bit. That's a fair point. It's a good position to target. I'm never going to shame a team for going O-line, but maybe if you do believe that the offensive line class, especially the interior offensive line class, will offer someone who's starter quality in the third round, it might just be worth it to target a defensive interior here. Might just be worth it to target an edge here. You know, it might be worth it to target Bo Nix here. It's essentially going to be Drew Locke, but upgraded. So from there, that might be where I would target. At pick 17, the Jacksonville Jaguars go Brian Thomas Jr., wide receiver out of LSU. 
six foot four, 205 pounds, deep threat. Dude is just an absolute, like he's a touchdown machine. You can just throw it up to him and just, he'll go and get it, right? No one's going to ever say Brian Thomas is a bad athlete. I think he needs to work in the nuances of his game in terms of his release package, his route running still a little bit underwhelming. He's still a good player. I'm not going to shame him. And I think the Jaguars would be smart to go after a wide receiver with their first round pick. At the same time, there is, I mean, I still think that he's not ready to be a wide receiver at one. If they keep Calvin Ridley, sure. I think that would be very smart. I think it would be a great idea for uh, the Jags to bring on Brian Thomas to learn from Calvin Ridley. But that's the only situation where I could find this worth the investment. At pick 18, the Cincinnati Bengals go Amarius Mims, right tackle out of Georgia. A uh, huge fan of this one. Jonah Williams, I would just kick his rear out of there. This could also be a little bit of a middle finger to the Pittsburgh Steelers where, well, my Pittsburgh Steelers, since Broderick Jones is on the squad, we're actually looking probably for another tackle. And, you know, this is a great way of reducing the ability to for the Steelers to have that instant chemistry on their O-line. So Marius Mims, great choice, 6'7", 340, absolute athlete, thought he should return to school and be a top three pick in 2025. Didn't do that, but you know what? Made our mocks easier because a lot of players are just deciding to tell me that they're going to make my mocks a hell of a lot harder. So thank you all for that. At pick 19, Green Bay Packers go Cooper DeGene. It makes sense. It's a pick that is highly versatile. The Green Bay Packers need a corner. They need safety. They need slot. They need everything um, in that secondary. And Cooper DeGene could fit one of, if not all of those roles. And at least down the board, you can choose the best defender in the secondary available rather than having to go pick a specialized position. At pick 20, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers go Nate Wiggins, cornerback out of Clemson, 6'2", 185. You know, great frame. I do see that some of my Tampa Bay fans are saying they're going to target secondary. Uh, This is, I think it's a solid value for Nate Wiggins. I'm not over the moon about him. I have some other corners above him, but still a really solid corner. I still need to get actually Denzel Burke off my board. Oh, finally, we can actually have a board that does not have two 14s on it, by the way. Holla. Heyo. Uh, but Nate Wiggins, you know, he, to me is a top 40 player, great field instincts. Yeah. I just have some other corners above him. So yeah, breaks my heart, but right here, 24 Denzel Burke, adios amigo, uh, pick number 21, the Arizona Cardinals select Terry and Arnold out of Alabama. You know, one of my favorite players, I think his nickname is ghost even better. You know, I should, he's my number eight player right now. Probably would raise him up to like two or one. If, uh, you know, if you were a little bit taller, just because that nickname ghost, you already know that's going to be like, you know, a player's going to be good. We got sauce in your name, ghost, like you just know. But in reality, Terry and Arnold is very similar to Joey Porter Jr. In terms of his field instincts, he is physical. I think that he needs to work on his reaction time on uh, slants, you know, post corners, et cetera. Those 45 degree cuts, just something that he does not defend well. So hopefully he gets to fix that up or at least a defensive coordinator knows to maybe shade him on the inside and get him impressed so he doesn't really give that much cushion because that reaction time is the only negative on Terry and Arnold, in my opinion, besides maybe being a little bit under height wise because he's just six foot. And, you know, it's a little bit different when you have a six foot two, six foot three corner who has that length as well. At pick 22 for the Los Angeles Rams, they select Chop Robinson. Finally, another connoisseur of Chop Robinson here. Uh, Chop is super young, super developmental. If Aaron Rod- Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Donald decides to stay, then that would be an amazing mentor for Chop Robinson to learn his form and just continue developing into the best player he can be. The Rams would be foolish to not try to target an edge rusher sometime in the draft. I do think Chop might be a little bit too synonymous with his role and not very complimentary to Byron Young because both of them will be primarily speed edge rushers and more of the finesse type rather than pure power. But you don't have to have one and one. You could just develop a defense that can work really well with two extremely talented edge rushers. I do think with JC Latham on the board, it's very tough not to try to put him to left tackle and see what the heck happens. But, you know, it is what it is. It's still a very solid pick. The Steelers then select Kool-Aid McKinstry. We need a corner too. I would prefer JC Latham here, but I do think that, you know, there is a little bit of some sour, uh, sour taste left in people's mouth after his, you know, very poor performance. And, you know, I thought that to be fair, he did a very good job in some run blocking versus some very good players in the Rose Bowl. But, you know, he still has shown a little bit of a need for development as a pass blocker. 
It's not like it's going to be much of a downgrade from Dan Moore, but we'll see what happens there. The Steelers wouldn't be remiss at all to go after Kool-Aid McKinstry, who is my number two corner in the draft. Very physical. This team needs it. And it's going to be one hell of a duo between Kool-Aid and JPJ. Pick number 24, the Dolphins select Braylon Trice, my number five player in the class. He's 274 pounds. This guy just absolutely eats, both literally and metaphorically. Uh, great player. I don't think that the Dolphins are desperate to go after Braylon Trice and go after an edge rusher at this point. But, you know, they, they did kind of, right here, this explains it. Um, they did lose their top two edge rushers this season ending injuries could be in the market to try to replace one of them or at least have someone who might be a little bit more on the healthy side. Braylon Trice is a phenomenal player. I would not shame it. I do think interior offensive line, kind of a big issue. So might be the way I roll, but it still is understandable why Braylon Trice would be a very solid selection for them. Some people are even climbing for wide receiver, but we'll see about that. At pick 25, the Philadelphia Eagles go Ennis Rakestraw. Man, I got to get an official grade on this guy. I'm going to be taking it on the chin. I haven't done enough research on him, but, you know, cornerback for the Eagles, regardless, is a very solid position to target. You have two corners that I can really trust after this year, and that's going to be Keeley and Eli. Eli was a top 64 player for me. Same thing with Keeley. So it's nice to see that the Eagles got to snag both of them, and both of them were having success, but they're still not ready this year. And, you know, you're getting one more corner in there, allowing a rotation, allowing when someone's having an off day to be able to at least be subbed out for someone who's still starter quality is so key, especially when injuries come into factor during the playoffs. Having two starter quality boundary corners to at least lock up the top two weapons, super key. So for me, I'm perfectly fine with Ennis Rakestraw being a cornerback selection for the Eagles. A little bit early for me for Ennis, but again, you got JC Latham on the board, probably would have been the pick I went after. At pick 26, the Kansas City Chiefs go Troy Franklin. Uh, you know, he has the speed, the deep threat ability. I think he'd fit very, very well. Uh, deep down, I would really want Xavier Leggett just because I would love to see a 230-pound dude who can run just as fast as Troy work in a Kansas City Chiefs offense. You have him and Raw, that'd be crazy because both of them are very dynamic after the catch. So you wouldn't have to really put all the, the weight and pain on my buddy Raw's back. So... Troy Franklin's still a great choice. I'm not going to complain about it. Houston Texans then select Chris Braswell out of Alabama. I didn't get that great of a vibe from Chris Braswell. I would say he is a second rounder for me, but you know, to be fair, late first, late second, not that big of a discrepancy. A uh, great player. He just, to me, doesn't offer. He didn't get me excited. Let me put it that way. I thought he was a very solid player, but I didn't see him as a game-changing edge rusher. Again, top-heavy edge class. So understandable if a team is really looking to grab an edge might be the range they do it in. But I think with all the top tier defensive interiors on the board, that's the way I'd rock again. You know, y'all know my love for Byron Murphy at this point has no, has no out. It's, it's just there. It will be there forever. So big fan of Byron Murphy at this pick, big fan of Andre sweat at this pick. That's where I'd rock. But again, defensive interior, not the highest wins above replacement position compared to edge rusher. I picked 28, the Detroit Lions go TJ Tampa out of Iowa State. Uh, this team could definitely use a cornerback. I'm not going to shame them. Really, it's a good pick. Uh, TJ Tampa, it's a little bit early for me, but he's been super consistent, and it's a valuable position on a team that's really looking for a corner. I like it. It's just a little bit early for me in my eyes for TJ Tampa. Still a good player, though. Pick number 29, the Buffalo Bills go Devontae Walker. Deep down, I have a weird feeling that poor Connor had this as uh, as a Mecca Buka and then had to change it. But, you know, maybe not because a lot of the PFF guys love Devontae Walker as well. I'm not there with Tez, but he's getting a re-eval soon anyways. Six foot two, 200 pounds. It's a very good build for a wide receiver too on a team that is looking just for a little bit more of a spark in that second receiver position. At pick 30, there's JC Latham. Hello. Dallas Cowboys go J.C. Latham to train to be that left tackle for the Cowboys. I, you know, the value is there. He has, he probably does need an extra year of development. I don't, I'm not sure if he fully declared for the draft. Yeah, he probably did because, I mean, what, what are you going to do? They're either going to transfer or come out in the draft, RIP, to uh, my buddy there in, well, not a buddy, but our all childhood friend in Nick Saban, who really allowed Alabama football to be Alabama football. So thank you to Nick for everything he's done. But JC, 
I mean, this would be unbelievable value. If the Cowboys are able to steal a J.C. Latham from the Eagles, essentially, since the Eagles went corner, man, I think that would be a decision the Eagles would regret for a little bit. But it is what it is. Pick number 31, San Francisco 49ers go Jordan Morgan out of Arizona. I made this pick myself. I think this team needs a right tackle desperately. It needs a left tackle solution for the long run. You know, maybe I'd go Kingsley Suamataea to have that development or to have that instant impact at right tackle as he's developing to be the left. But Jordan Morgan has the same strengths, just a little bit less experience. At 32 and ending off the draft, we got Keon Coleman going to the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, intriguing because the Ravens don't really have a receiver who is like Keon Coleman, that jump catch threat. And I would love to see how Lamar would actually use a superstar like Keon. But, you know, the intrigue gets me enough of the way there. I would prefer offensive line, but hard to say that I wouldn't want to see what happens. As a Steelers fan, I maybe wouldn't, but as a fan of the NFL and the NFL draft would be extremely intriguing. So that's going to be video. Thank you so much for watching and supporting the show as always. Love y'all. See you on the far side. Peace.